Hi everyone and welcome to the Flinders University Paleontology Labs. My name is Aaron Caymans, I'm a lecturer in paleontology here at Flinders University and today we're going to take you on a behind the scenes tour of what goes on here at Flinders Paleontology. Now as you can see, we work all across the state in a whole range of different areas and also on a whole range of different organisms. Everything from some of the oldest fish in the world and that first transition onto land through to the extinction of the giant megafauna that used to roam when humans first lived in Australia. Now it's a pretty special place to work and we can't talk about everything we work on. So one of the sites that we're really going to be focusing on today is a place called Lake Calabona. Now Lake Calabona is a place that's at the top of the Flinders Ranges, just north of Adelaide. So it's about a full day's drive to the top of the Flinders and then we head out to Lake Calabona. And Lake Calabona is a very special place because it's where thousands and thousands of megafaunal animals got stuck in the mud. So there are whole skeletons preserved there, there are gut contents, there are skin, fur and feather impressions, and sometimes we even find the poucher, the joeys, still in their mother's pouch from when mum got stuck in the mud. We're going to divide the tour into two different parts today. The first part is going to look at the preparatory lab and how we go about preparing the fossils after they've come in from the field. The second part is going to be focusing on our clean lab, which is where all of the fossil study takes place. So you'll be hearing from various different Flinders paleontologists about what they're studying and what they're doing. G'day, my name's Kerry and I am the lab technician here at Flinders University in the paleontology department. So in paleontology, I would be more known as a preparator because fossils need to be prepared for study. So one of the ways that we prepare fossils is of course to release them from their rock, what we call the matrix. Now, some fossils are particularly hard and difficult to remove, so we've got some special tools. This is called a micro jack. This is basically a tiny, tiny jackhammer. It's an air powered tool. The little blade at the end uh, oscillates up and down 100 times a minute. And you just use this to chip away at the rock extremely carefully and release the bone. Uh, micro jacks come in many different sizes from extremely large to tiny ones that I use under a microscope. But for a specimen like this, this size here is ideal. So here we've got a collection of bones that have actually been found out at Lake Calabona. And Kerry's going to tell us a little bit about how we go about collecting these bones and some of the challenges that are faced when we collect these things. Okay, well the first thing to know about the Lake Calabona specimens is that Lake Calabona is an extremely remote location. It is a long way from home to go and get these guys and there's nobody else out there to help you. The second thing about Lake Calabona is it's a salt lake. It's muddy, it's salty. Uh, the fossils are preserved in this environment and as soon as you begin to excavate them, they can begin to deteriorate because you've changed what preserved them in the first place. So to collect a fossil, we would walk around the lake until we found the tiniest bit of bone sticking up over the surface of the lake. Uh, erosion would naturally expose these fossils. Then we dig a huge trench around the bones. Uh, we wrap a plaster jacket around them until we make almost like a white egg to protect them. And then those eggs come back in the car with us all the way back to the lab. And in the lab, we open them up and we actually see what we've got with our fossils. But the fun doesn't end there, does it? No. Like I said, you've changed the preservational environment. So as soon as you open your eggs, uh, these fossils start to degrade. Salt can come out of the bones, uh, form a nice little salty crust on them, and actually deteriorate and smash the bones up. A lot of these bones are not preserved perfectly. As we can see here, this one's crushed and smashed. 
uh, through weight of sediment on it, uh, through all sorts of erosional factors. And it's been well over 40,000 years. A lot can happen in that time to a specimen. So my job here is to not repair these bones, but to make sure they never come apart in the first place. Today, plaster jackets. I've got my fossil here. This has come out of the field. It's been half prepared. Uh, the other half underneath still needs a lot of work. Plaster has been used in this industry almost for the entire length of the industry. It's a great, cheap, portable substance that can make hard shells around otherwise impossible to move fossil material. So you may have seen something like this come out of the field when people are digging fossils. This is just a plaster jacket tightly wrapped around the shape of a bone. The plaster jacket means that we can pick this up. It's tough. We can transport it. If this bone wasn't in this plaster jacket, I would not be able to pick this up. It would crumble into hundreds of tiny little pieces. So this keeps bones safe until we can get them back into the lab, harden them, clean them, get them ready for study. The process of plaster jacketing is very simple. First of all, we use tissues and some water. I'll stipple them on with a brush to get a nice form fit layer. This will be our separating layer between our precious fossil and the subsequent layers of plaster that we'll put on. The separating layer means that as I'm digging down again, I know exactly where to find that fossil because there'll be a coating of tissue and nothing else will stick to the fossil itself. After that, I'm going to put a layer of wet sand over the top of the fossil and the sand is going to fill up all of these holes, all of these gaps, all of these little details and make a nice smooth dome for me to put my plaster shell over. If I don't have a nice smooth dome, the plaster itself will go into these crevices and will catch on the fossil and we can actually break fossils trying to get the plaster off again. And the last step will be of course the plaster jacket itself. Uh, often we will use hessian and powdered plaster in the field because it makes a nice strong thick heavy jacket but today because we're in the lab I'm going to use these pre-made plaster bandages. Let's get on with it. I finished stippling tissue all over the fossil. It's a nice separating layer, probably about two layers thick of tissues just to keep it all safe and secure. Now I can put this away, bring out some nice slightly wet sand and I'm going to coat this with a protective layer of sand. Remember when I turn this upside down this fossil will rest in this sand. This sand is the cushion that's going to keep this from snapping off all of these delicate little pieces. I've finished my sand. As you can see, I've made a nice smooth shape. There's no undercuts, there's no places for the plaster to get caught. Later on, when I need to release this fossil from here, it'll be just a matter of sweeping the sand out of all those crevices and cracks. So now I can get on with the plaster. So these plaster bandages are magnificent. They've already got plaster inside them. They're very, very quick and simple to use. We just dip them in some water and start to lay them over our specimen. I've got one layer of plaster bandages on this fossil. Now this looks lovely and strong, but it actually isn't. This is a, a paper thin coating. In the field, we would cross strap and we would build a very, very strong, maybe a centimeter or more thick plaster block to go on this. But in the lab, because I'm just going to turn this over and remove more weight, I don't need anything near as strong. However, I am going to mix up another batch of just pure plaster and thicken this up to give it a bit more strength. easy. So what I've done here is made a nice solid base for this fossil to rest on. When this is finally dry, I'm going to turn it over 180 degrees, then cut what's now the bottom off of the fossil so I can access the other side without having to lift, manipulate, 
or otherwise damage a fragile specimen. This will be ready tomorrow. So here we are with Isaac Kerr. He's one of the PhD students here at the Flinders University Paleontology Lab, and he's working on some of these fantastic fossils that are coming out of Lake Calabona. Isaac, would you like to tell us a bit more about what you're working on for your PhD? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm working on Protemnodon kangaroos, which is a genus of giant kangaroo that died out about 40,000 years ago. And the very last of those we can see at Lake Calabona. Um, this is one of them here. This is an um, old female Protemnodon. Um, and as you can see, when I compare it to a red kangaroo skull, it's a very, very big kangaroo. Um, and we found her lying on um, her side in Lake Calabona. So um, unlike a lot of the other specimens, she wasn't found um, to have died bogged. She was lying on her side, um, which suggests a different mode of death, which is very interesting. Now, not all fossils are entombed in mud. Sometimes they're entombed in much harder things. And that means we need to use different kinds of preparation techniques to be able to access the fossils. Arthur Crichton is doing his PhD on one of these sites that's quite challenging to prepare. Arthur, do you want to tell us about how you prepare these fossils? I'm doing my PhD on a site in the Northern Territory, which preserves some of the earliest representatives of modern Australian marsupials. And um, one of the, oh, which is great, which, which is really exciting, but actually prepping out the material from the rock is really quite challenging because the material is highly fragmentary and it's um, relatively soft compared to the limestone which it's encased in. So I use weak acetic acid um, to dissolve away the limestone and extract the bones. How do you make sure that you're preserving the bone and not dissolving it when you put it in the acid? I make sure that I harden the bone every time the rock comes out of acid so that the newly exposed surfaces don't fall apart. So for instance, this crocodile snout here took about five months to repair out. So a lot of work goes into this before we can actually see what fossils are hidden in these rocks, but they're super important. Other deposits like the Wellington Caves that, that Diana Fusco is working on face similar challenges. So here we can see the before and after effects of acid prep on material from Wellington Caves. As you can see, it's very dense with well-preserved small bone material. And we'd never find any of that without these techniques, would we? No, that's right. Now, we don't just work on fossils here in the paleontology lab. Part of understanding extinct organisms is to make sure that we've got a good comparative collection. So understanding the morphology of modern organisms is really important too. And it's skeletons like this that we use in our undergrad teaching that will give you a chance to understand how animals are put together and how we go about interpreting those in the fossil record. One of the other things we do here in the prep lab is we make casts of fossils. There's a very good reason to make a cast of a fossil because something like this, if it was real, you'd be unable to pick it up. It would be too fragile, possibly too heavy. So we make plastic ones that look exactly like the real ones. They're the same size, they're the same shape. Uh, here's one unpainted. And here's one that we have all painted up as a finished product, ready for people to use for study or for reference. So for those of you who are interested in paleontology, another part of my job is to manage volunteers here in the lab. So we have regular volunteers that come in to help prepare fossils, to help us sort through our sediments to pick out the tiny little rat teeth, and to help with moulding and casting and other just general lab activities. So for more information on that, hit the website or follow the links. Cheers.